Good evening. It is a true pleasure to be among you and, and a, a privilege to be asked to speak to you tonight. Um, I, um, by way of introduction, let me say first and foremost, I'm a practicing physician. I um, uh, direct a palliative care program at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in, in New Hampshire. It's a 400-bed academic medical center. Connected to it is a um, National Cancer Institute Cancer Center, one of the 40 premier cancer centers in the United States. We're a trauma center. We're a, a neonatal center. Um, and it's a, it's a busy uh, hub of a place. Uh, I teach, uh, and I'm a professor of medicine at the uh, Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth. The lecture that I'm about to give, the pre presentation, I actually developed uh, to give to third-year medical students at Dartmouth Medical School, now the Geisel School of Medicine. Because in, in the United States, and it may be similar here, for the first two years, uh, students are mostly in classrooms and studying or in their learning labs and, and studying basic sciences. And, and then they go out to the wards or the clinics and, and start seeing patients. About halfway through that year, the school brings the, the class back together as a whole. Now, the class has been together for two years, but then gets dispersed. And they come back together for two weeks of cross-cutting um, learning. Uh, with, um, with uh, issues of ethics and humanities, but also of, of clinical work that um, cuts across the different disciplines. We are, we are privileged to, to have a full day of, during that uh, time. And when I present to the, the class, I try to make it reasonably interactive, more interactive than I can do this evening. Um, but I challenge the students simply by asking, you know, what are doctors for? Now that you've been out seeing patients, and you've seen many patients who, frankly, we are uh, only partly able to help in terms of treating their disease, um, what are we for? It's an interesting interaction and conversation with people. You know, first and foremost, of course, doctors are for saving lives, right? That's why people come to us, people who are seriously ill, people with, certainly with cancer but also people with, you know, respiratory issues or, or heart, uh, a, a cardiac or congestive heart failure. They want to, you know, have their lives saved. And that's a noble and important and perhaps the core reason that we became physicians, to save lives, to preserve lives, because life is precious. Um, the problem, of course, is that um, we have a difficulty. In, in saving lives. Uh, th this doctor is talking to the uh, patient's wife and he says, good news, Mrs. Bryant, I think we got it all. It's funny, but not really, is it? But in fact, while doctors are intending to serve patients, to inst intending to treat people, in the United States, and I suspect here as well, what has happened is we've been mainly focused on treating disease or injuries and disease. And sometimes in my country, the focus on the patient gets diffuse. And sometimes it's not really, we're, we're less concerned with the person and more concerned with the disease. And many, many people have said to us, I feel lost in this. I feel like nobody's in attending to me. In fact, in one sense, palliative care and palliative medicine has developed as a response to an acknowledged and frankly studied and, and documented lack of attention to the persons living with disease rather than the disease itself. It was an incredibly healing experience, he said, but somehow I still wound up dead. In fact, while I celebrate the science and the technology that gives us the diagnostic prowess that we have to categorize and understand the pathophysiology of disease and the science and technology to treat the, the causes of disease and to reverse much of the pathophysiology, that I celebrate the power we have to save lives and extend lives, we all have a challenge, for we have yet to make even one person immortal. So it leaves us at some point with acknowledging that we have to treat more than the disease if we are going to really serve the patients that come to us for, for care. In fact, thinking of conceptual models, we teach medical students to think inside a box called the medical model. 
The medical model is a powerful model, and I'm not here to denigrate it, but just to notice its, its limitations. The medical model is built on the twin human health problems of illness and injury. And the goals of medicine are to cure, to prolong life, to restore function, and to relieve symptoms and suffering. In this um, depiction, I have a palliative care uh, depicted in sort of painting ourselves into a corner where we're the ones that treat pain and suffering when people have a serious illness. And that's true, but it's not the whole story. For as I'll hope to show you, palliative care, in fact, all of medicine, because palliative care doesn't have exclusivity in this province, has more to offer in our service to people than just treating their disease or their injury. In fact, if you learn nothing else, if, if you take nothing else away from, from uh, my talk this evening, please take this, that the fundamental nature of illness is only partly medical. It's certainly only partly biological. The fundamental nature of illness is personal. It's intensely so, both for the person who is seriously ill and for those who love them, their families. And everything else that I'm going to say will make sense if you can remember that the fundamental nature of illness is personal. It's only partly biological, partly what is nowadays called medical, though I would say the personal is also medical. Of course, if we can't treat or save lives, at least we can guide and advise patients. Here, a physician is talking to a patient and says, either this is the wrong chart or, well, let's just hope this is the wrong chart. It's awkward, it's embarrassing to be in front of a patient and, and look and think, well, you're not going to be able to cure this patient. Think of uh, Odette's, the, uh, uh, the um, bone scan that Odette showed, where a patient is riddled with cancer, unlikely to be cured, right? This is funny and yet not. I show uh, uh, cartoons, in fact, not to entertain. We're working tonight. But because if a cartoon made it to one of the national magazines in my country, the New Yorker magazine, um, or the Economist or the like, it got there because in some way it resonates with something about the social psychology. It's funny because it makes us a little uncomfortable because there's some truth in it. It's part, therefore, of the psychology of the people who come to us as patients and patients' families. Of course, if we can't cure disease, at least we can treat pain. We had a nice overview of the treatment of pain. And in fact, we know in America, 100 million people, excuse me, uh, yeah, 100 million people are considered to have some degree of chronic pain on any given year. That's almost a third of the pop adult population. It's a remarkably high number. And this is the Institute of Medicine uh, discovered this or, or reported this. It's not an uh, exaggeration. And yet these days we have more understanding of the pathophysiology of pain, including chronic pain, and more exquisitely elegant treatments to bring to reverse that pathophysiology than it ever before in human history. Still, we have more pain probably than it ever before in human history. And while we have been teaching the use of opioids and other pain management techniques, we need to understand and acknowledge that we've also created a side effect of people suffering from and often dying of addiction disorders, the overuse of, of prescription pain medications, which in my country is epidemic. In fact, in this slide, I know you can't see this from the back of the room, but this is a, a very recent uh, survey of the causes of, of um, uh, deaths from uh, overdoses of prescribed medications. The box on the, the um, bar on the left is opioids. And then it goes to anti-epileptic and anti-Parkinsonian medications, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and others. So opioids remain a huge public health problem in the United States, soaring amounts of unintended deaths from prescription pain medicines. It keeps you humble in thinking about this and in prescribing. It doesn't diminish our responsibility to adequately diagnose and treat pain 
but it means we need to be very cautious, not only about prescribing pain medicines, but also about encouraging people to get rid of the pain medicines that they're no longer using, to clean out their medicine cabinets, which often we forget to do. Now, we can guide and advise patients. You know, in, in these days, we talk not just about informed consent or informed decision making, but the, the new term of art is shared decision making with patients. Now, that's come a long way. I was born in 1951. As I was growing up, shared decision making happened when the doctor shared his decisions with you. We've come a, a bit further than that. These days, we realize that patients are already expert in their values, their preferences, and their priorities. Hopefully, we are expert in the science and technology of diagnosis and treatment of disease. Together, we can work to match the science and technology to the values, preferences, and priorities of each individual person. If there are three people in this room with the exact same set of diagnoses, and frankly, most of the patients that I see clinically have two or three diagnoses, which in the earlier part of the 20th century would have ended their life. Many of the people I see have not only a cancer or congestive heart failure, but maybe they have uh, uh, um, severe high, high blood pressure or diabetes or any number of you know, cerebrovascular problems and the like that might have claimed their life earlier. You know, in the, in, even in the early part of the 20th century, the first uh, episode of pulmonary edema would take somebody away. The first big heart attack would usually kill somebody. Cancer was a subacute diagnosis. Most people with cancer, you know, felt a, a, a lump under their arm or in their supracovicular area, and they were dead usually within three or four weeks of an infection, blood clot, or some other um, complication of the cancer. These days, we live with diagnoses for, for quite some time. But we, if there were three people in the room with the same cluster of diagnoses, the best care for each one might be quite different one from another. I don't know what the best care is for somebody by looking at algorithms or even best practices that are published alone. I have to use that information, the evidence base of medicine, from randomized controlled trials or meta-analyses, forming, you know, in adherence with best practice guidelines, but it has to be applied individually, personally, highly personalized to the patient's own values, preferences, and priorities. Let's look a little bit for a moment at how we help people make decisions. You know, usually the shorthand is when a decision about perhaps a cancer treatment or a cardiac treatment uh, is in front of somebody, we, we say, well, we want to look at, at the risks and the benefits, right? We sort of hold our hands, I do anyhow, hold my hands in a hand like a balance beam, right? Balance scale. And we want to look at the risks and benefits. That's fine as a shorthand, but let's be honest. It's not just the benefits versus the risks. It's actually the potential benefits because none of the benefits are ever assured versus the known burdens of an illness. Let's use cancer chemotherapy or radiotherapy just as an example, plus the potential uh, problems of the risks of having uh, that treatment. So it's the potential benefits versus the known burdens and the risks. And, and we, that's how we sort of have to balance this to help guide people through decisions. In fact, however, I've come to understand that the ground on which this balance beam or balance scale is, is set is rarely level. In fact, it is, it is tilted a bit by the quality of life of the person at the time we're having this conversation. If the quality of life of the person is so bad, if they are suffering so horrendously that any treatment who, which has any, even a small chance of making their, them better is worth any burden and potential risk, they may lean toward taking the treatment because their current quality of life isn't really worth living. On the other hand, if their quality of life is pretty good and the potential benefits are modest, maybe a few months more of life, but the risks are quite severe and the burdens quite heavy, such as, you know, um, uh, bone marrow transplant therapy, they may lean away 
be inclined away from making that tr choice to have that treatment. Does that make any sense? So it helps me in counseling people to assess their current quality of life and, and see how that fits within this uh, exercise. In fact, however, while I've just said that all treatments uh, decisions have to be highly personalized to the individual's values, preferences, and priorities, in fact, there's a lot of commonality among the human condition when we're forced to face or live with serious illness and face the fact that time may be limited. Most people will say something along these lines. Please use all medical treatments that allow me to have a quality of life that's worth living as long as the potential benefits outweigh the burdens and the risks, and that's reasonable. Most people will frankly say, I want to live as long as I can live well. And then, if we remember to ask, they will say, and then I want to die gently. Now, in fact, most physicians forget to ask that other part. They will say, would you like to be on the ventilator if we think you, know, you can get off of it in a bit, even though you have severe lung cancer or severe emphysema? Or would you like to have CPR if there's any chance of being better or, you know, whatever the, the treatment is? It's as if we're asking a one-tailed question in a two-tailed world. As I do my work as a consultant in palliative medicine, one of the sections of my consultation is called goals of care. And when I ask people about their goals of care, I often will clarify with them that they want to live as long as they can live well. But then I ask, is it, would it be fair to assume that eventually, when your time comes to leave this life, you would like to die gently? When I ask that question, it's not uncommon that people look at me like I'm crazy. Well, yeah, of course. But the fact is, if I don't write that down, if I don't clarify, that yes, they would like to die gently, and most people say, yeah, if possible. Do you ever think about where you'd want to be and how you'd want to be cared for if you knew that your time was reasonably short? Most people will say, I'd like to be home if possible, cared for by my friends and family, surrounded by people I know and love. I'd like to have hospice care at home if possible. If we don't ask that question in an academic medical center, people are at high risk of being in the hospital often being in an intensive care unit at the end of life. Because the, all their doctors will, will say, well, every time I ask Joe if he wants a treatment, he says yes. Every single time I, he's never said no to anything I've asked. And that's true. But we've never asked, Joe, if you knew that time was reasonably short, how would you want to be cared for when you leave this life? So we've only asked one about the treatments. We've never asked about the way he'd want to die. In fact, in the United States, through nobody's ill intention, still 70% of people die in institutions, over 50% in hospitals. 20%, in fact, of American deaths now occur in an ICU, where very few people want to die. OK, let me change gears. Are there limits, ethical limits, to a doctor's role? Now, I go through this because I think, and I'm speaking self-critically, that we medical educators do a terrible job of teaching ethical boundaries, professional boundaries. And most students come to, to medicine highly sensitive and compassionate, and we teach them that because of professional boundaries, they have to in some way be emotionally detached. That it's not OK to show emotions. It's really not OK to have emotions is what what, is what at least the hidden curriculum teaches. Well, let me just say clearly, that's not true. Professional boundaries are very simple in the, in the main. I will assert there are really three things that doctors must not do. Here's the first. No personal gain. What I mean by that is we're here to serve patients. That's why we take oaths. That's what we do. Our profession has existed from antiquity in the service of individual patients and in the service of society in matters related to health, right? 
So it's always about serving patients. We are not supposed to end up uh, taking uh, money that is outside of our salaries or, or, uh, or established uh, charges for professional services. Here's doctors without boundaries. He says, so could we have all your stuff after you die? We would never do that, would we? We have fund development offices in our universities to do such things. <laughs> and in fact, we do, because it's not okay for a treating physician to ask a patient or the patient's family for money or for a promise of a donation after the person dies. It transgresses a professional boundary. We are here solely to serve the person. Um, number two, <laughs> no sex. That's one that we gave up in taking the oath and that's been the case since the very beginnings of our profession. Doctors are given the authority and given the privilege unlike anybody else in, the in, in society, of having intimate access to patients, including access to their bodies. We see people who are undressed, we probe them with our fingers and, and, and our hands and, and, and instruments in ways that nobody else could do. But in response to that, we have utterly given up having sex with patients. People will say, well, but Dr. Bayak, I know of a couple who's been married for 25 years and, and it started as a therapeutic relationship. I have no problem. I'm not here to judge any of that. But the exception does not disprove the principle. It is not okay. Patients are supposed to feel safe in being vulnerable to physicians. We have more authority. We have more power than them in this relationship. And that power and that boundary needs to be honored even when the patient is the one who initiates the relationship. Oh, Dr. Bayek, you know you feel it too. You know, you're the only one who understands what I feel. This is um, an HBO series. Do you guys get HBO around here? So this is an HBO series in treatment. Uh, the uh, actor Gabriel Byrne playing a psychoanalyst, uh, Paul Weston, and his Monday morning patient is Laura. And Laura feels this yearning, this intense feeling of intimacy for her psychotherapist. And she initiates the physical contact, but he acquiesces. He crosses a line. It's not okay. This is counter-transference writ large. He has transgressed a, 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 um, sac uh, a sacred um, professional boundary. It's wrong. And thirdly, and mostly, no killing. Not okay. Now I know that this is being debated all over the world. It's certainly being debated in, in the United States about euthanasia and assisted suicide. And I know, because I read the literature, that there's an active debate in Australia. But this is one, again, that we gave up early on in the history of medicine. You might remember these tablets. Thou shalt not kill. In, the, in uh, the Hippocratic Oath, it says, I will neither give a deadly drug to anyone who asked for it, nor will I make a suggestion to this effect. And the American Medical Association uh, continues to reaffirm its insistence that even where it's legal, in Oregon, in Washington State, now in Vermont, uh, in Montana, it is not okay for physicians to do this. Now, the public, and including those far majority of the public in my country that wants assisted suicide, physician assisted suicide to be legal thinks that the resistance of people like me and the American Medical Association is about somehow protecting the profession. It's about our sensitivities. It's nothing of the sort. This has always been about protecting a vulnerable public from the power of the medical profession. In fact, corollaries to thou shalt not kill in terms of assisted suicide or euthanasia is we are not supposed to participate in capital punishment. Now that may seem barbaric here, but in my country there's a lot of states that have legal capital punishment, right? Legal executions, even where it's court ordered. Doctors stand aside. They are not supposed to take part in it. It is not okay. We're also not supposed to take part in forced interrogations or torture even when the police authorities are asking you to do it, even where the military 
authorities are ordering your, you to do it. Physicians have through all of human history said, we step aside. This is not something we are supposed to do. And I will hold to that is an important part of the fundamental principle and sort of the eye beams or girders of the foundation of medical profession and by extension, part of what keeps the integrity of our society intact. You know this guy? This is Jack Kevorkian with his uh, Thanatron. You, you, these days, you folks here have, what's his name, Philip Nischke. N did I mispronounce his name? He's famous, though. He's not acting, and Jack Kevorkian wasn't acting as a physician. In fact, he was acting as an outlaw in this regard. He was usurping, taking medical knowledge and going further. Nitschke, by the way, isn't acting as a physician in this regard. He's promoting helium hoods, right? Which you can get at, you know, you can get the helium from party stores. But he's acting um, in, in a way that, um, that is dangerous for our profession and frankly dangerous for the ethics of society. In my country, there's a lot of confusion. Here's an elderly guy saying to his wife, remind me, dear, what, which is it we're interested in, assisted living or assisted suicide? There's a lot of confusion about this. And while people think, you know, when I speak against legalizing assisted suicide, they think I'm somehow ultra-conservative, right? It's not that at all. In fact, by the way, my own personal politics are quite different. I'm pretty prog uh, politically progressive. You know, I'm for women's rights and voting rights and gay rights and, you know, um, um, quite on the left side of the political spectrum. But I treat a whole spectrum of human beings. And in fact, in society, even palliative care and hospice is sometimes conflated with or accused of being euthanasia itself. It's not anything like that. But in order to be able to have access to treat patients and their families who have conservative values, we need to be very clear that we do not do this. In fact, palliative care is all about preserving or saving, excuse me, preserving and celebrating life. Life is a precious gift, but it's a finite gift. And in order to affirm life, one needs to affirm all of life. So, this, this is, a, um, is meant to be provocative. It was published as meant to be provocative. It's published by a, a, a right-wing social conservative, um, um, really radical um, publication. But it shows that there is great polarization in the public about how we care for people through the end of life. The public needs to know that we are true north, that doctors do not do this. In fact, while there are very few limits to our ability to alleviate symptoms and suffering, that is very different than, than eliminating the person who is suffering. Alleviating suffering is different than eliminating the sufferer. However, this quote um, is, needs to be taken to heart. This is one of the true founders of palliative medicine, Robert, Dr. Robert Twycross in Oxford, England, who said years ago, a doctor who has never been tempted to kill a patient probably has had limited clinical experience or is unable to empathize with those who suffer. It's true. About once a week, I'll meet a patient who in my heart of hearts, I think would be better off had they died last week. Their quality of life is so poor. I'll meet people who I think in my heart of hearts would be better off if they died later today. But in so saying and in so acknowledging, I also know that it's not my role to end their life. I can alleviate their suffering and I'll talk about how doing so. That's different than eliminating the person who is suffering. The fact that we cannot imagine that there are times when you cannot imagine what else you might do for a person is why we work in teams. Because sometimes I'm too tired. I'm too frustrated. Perhaps I've been up too late. Perhaps I've frankly seen too many people in distress over the last week. I've been on call for two weeks in a row. Sometimes I'm just empty and, and I'm 
a professor of doing this stuff. I have good expertise in doing this stuff. Sometimes other physicians may not have been trained in certain syndromes that can cause serious distress, and they don't know. They cannot imagine what else they can do for a person. That's why we work in teams. This is our team, palliative care team at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center, which meets every single morning, every single weekday morning, to collaborate in an interactive fashion to work thinking together about how we can control people's pain and, and improve their quality of life. This is Mr. Denton. This is his real name. I use his name with his, his and his family's permission. Mr. Denton was a, a patient of, of ours in a hospice program in Missoula, Montana in the early 1990s. Now, we didn't know as much as I know now about how to treat pain. Mr. Denton had a nasty head and neck tumor. He was suffering with severe pain. We promised him that we would not allow him to die in physical agony, and it was proving difficult to keep that promise. At the time this picture was taken, Mr. Denton was receiving 1,000 milligrams of intravenous morphine every hour. To that, we gradually titrated up up to three milligrams of intravenous midazolam every hour. And Mr. Denton was still in significant distress. At the time, I didn't know what else to do. I know actually more than what we would do today. We would rotate opioids today. We would use things like ketamine to reset his MDMA receptors and, and, and things of that nature. But at the time, we were stuck. I called around, not only in town, but I called around the country to the, to the pain management specialists that I knew to ask what else could we think of, what else could we do, because I was out of, you know, ideas. Eventually, we, we looked at how we, what the um, um, etiology of his distress was. Indeed, these days, as I sometimes debate proponents of physician-assisted suicide, they'll They'll present cases like Mr. Denton. They'll say, well, yes, you know, Ira, that's all very good, but how about a case like this? And they'll, they'll present somebody with what we call terminal agitation. Terminal agitation actually has its own differential diagnosis. Sometimes people's pain has gotten so bad that they may be so close to death that they're not able to speak to us, right? They can't describe it, but maybe they have, you know, bled into a um, metastasis in their liver. Maybe they've got ischemic bowel disease and, and, and are, are suffering from severe pain and can't speak about it. They can't explain it. Maybe they're in withdrawal. It's not usually opioid withdrawal because we're giving them enough pain medicine to cover that. But maybe it's uh, withdrawal from uh, Xanax or, or um, Alprazolam. Um, that they've been taking for the last few months, and now that they're not taking oral medicines, maybe they're in opi uh, benzo withdrawal. Maybe they've got something called akesthesia. Do you know what that is? Akesthesia is this sort of inner restlessness that people get, some people get in association with neuroleptics, like halopyridol. And that's not rare. I'm going to guess, I have never seen a, a study on it, but I would guess that about eight or so percent of people given halopyridol, if given it at high enough doses, will have this atypical, you know, paradoxical response of feeling m more restless. And it looks like anxiety, and the usual result is you give more of the same drug. But you got to think of this. Maybe they're in status epilepticus, and because they're not speaking to us or because their eyes are open, you don't think about seizures, but it can occur. These days, we can put an EEG on somebody, even in the ICU, pretty quickly and, and make that diagnosis and treat it appropriately. Maybe they're hypoxic. Or maybe, as my nursing colleagues have taught me over the years, maybe they just need a catheter. These days, we can do bladder scans and tell quite quickly, but it used to not be so easy. Or maybe they need to be disimpacted. And sometimes disimpacting somebody who is agitated like this Everything settles down. But to be honest, there are people like Mr. Denton for whom none of these issues seem to work and none of our potions and our protocols seem to address their, their suffering. So as I'm challenged, what are you going to do with this? In fact, Mr. Denton was not allowed to die in, in pain. Ultimately, we developed, we, we instituted a thiopental infusion using barbiturates in his family's home. Mr. Denton um, um, 
became quiet. He was not euthanized. He lived for 36 hours. During that time, care continued. He was turned. He was cleansed. His family was at his bedside helping us to adjust medications depending on their assessment of his restlessness. His brow was mopped. His mouth was moistened. I was there a great deal because this was the first patient who I had to institute uh, palliative sedation for. I wanted to make sure we weren't euthanizing him, but first and foremost, I wanted to make sure I was keeping the promise I had made to him that he would not die in physical agony. I have to tell you, because I was there, that there were tears around his bedside as his family grieved his imminent passing. But I also promise you that there was laughter at times at his bedside as Mr. Denton's life was reviewed, as he was honored and celebrated for the person he was, as stories were told about his rich life. If this seems you know, impossible for you, if you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't know where this fella comes from, but we could never do this around here, please remember this guy. Because Jack Kevorkian and now Philip Nitschke has called the question, for too many years, those of us in medicine, including those of us in palliative care, have promised people that they would not die in physical agony. And let's be honest, too often it hasn't been the case. It hasn't been the truth. In this modern era, we need to walk the talk. There is a difference between alleviating suffering and eliminating the sufferer, but there are no limits to what we can do to alleviate suffering when somebody is facing the end of life. Dr. Tim Quill and I are friends, but we often disagree quite vigorously around the legalization of physician-assisted suicide. Tim Quill is a palliative care physician and a good physician, but he wrongly, I believe, believes that physicians should be able to write lethal prescriptions. But we came together under the auspices of the American College of Physicians to write a paper and to outline the ethical use of sedative medications when none of the other pro protocols or potions are able to alleviate physical pain when somebody is dying. From this point forward, please know that there is a difference between treating pain and ending people's lives. Um, it is totally ethically appropriate. In fact, I would submit it is ethically required to use palliative sedation when nothing else is able to control people's pain. Those who assert that you have to, at some point, kill somebody to alleviate their pain are simply not true. It's simply not the case. Until somebody documents a patient for whom general anesthesia is not effective in controlling pain, I will assert that there is a difference here and that we must stick on the side of the difference of alleviating suffering. But what is palliative care for beyond this? Well, I just said alleviating symptoms and suffering are our first priorities but they're not our ultimate goals. In fact, because remember the point I asked you to, to, to take home, that the nature of serious illness is personal, not medical. That in addition to alleviating suffering, people have opportunities during this difficult time of life we call serious illness and dying opportunities that they have taught me over the years are of value to them. And if we as doctors don't acknowledge these opportunities, we, we give them short shrift. We, we, we actually conscript their attention solely to the medical, and they lose the personal. There are opportunities to communicate bad news and sad feelings among those that one loves. Opportunities to complete affairs. Yes, fiscal and legal affairs, turning over the deed to the house or the property, changing the, your will, making sure that people have your passwords so your family can get into your bank accounts and the things of that nature. But also completing relationships. You know, saying the things that would be left unsaid between people who loved one another, who love one another or once loved one another. Many people come to the end of life having a previous family, sometimes being divorced or separated from a, a spouse once or even twice. Resolving previously strained relationships, perhaps between a husband and wife who were married for 20 years, but then it ended in a bitter divorce, and then they haven't seen one another very much in the last 12 or 15 years. Perhaps it's between a father and son who loved one another but had a falling out and haven't talked in 10 years. When one or the other 
is facing the end of life, often, not always, but most of the time, there are things that they would like to say to one another, that the bonds that unite them begin to look larger and more important than the transgressions and the anger which have separated them. A chance to grieve together the impending loss of life and relationships. A chance to review one's life, to tell one's stories, and if possible, to record those stories as a legacy to those who leave behind, one's family, one's children, one's grandchildren, perhaps a generation you will never meet. Who else on the planet can leave stories in one's own voice like the person who is leaving this life. A chance to explore those realms of meaning and purpose, often through the medium of stories, which provide the logos that helps people feel integrated and having a sense of wellness within themselves. A chance to explore their connection to something larger than the self, something that will endure into an open-ended future. For many, it's their connection to God, but often it's a connection to nature, the ocean, you know, the mountains, or to a connection to a family that will live on for generations to come. I wrote a book called The Four Things That Matter Most. They're not things at all. They're, they're 11 words, four sentences that I've learned over the years are powerful counseling tools to help people have a sense of completion in the relationships that matter most. Please forgive me. I forgive you, because let's face it, there hasn't been a perfect relationship in the history of our species. Even the most close and loving relationships tend to be marked by some history of hurt feelings, misunderstandings, and sometimes real transgressions. Please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you is often like stating the obvious, but boy is it ever valuable to do it for the people that you love Often people die without having said these things and it feels that they, they suffer the consequences. Why wait? I teach that today is a good day. In fact, you don't have to be dying for these, for these sentences to matter, these sentences and, 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 and the emotions they convey. One only has to be mortal. Or if you're not mortal, personally, if you love someone who's mortal, well, that's enough to put you at risk of having things left unsaid as you approach the end of life. I said alleviating suffering is different than eliminating the sufferer, but it's also different than improving quality of life. Certainly, if somebody is suffering, by, by alleviating their suffering, you improve their quality of life. But people do not need to be suffering for us to be able to serve them in ways that may improve their quality of life. Having a chance to review your life, to complete relationships, to celebrate life often improves quality of life even if you're not suffering. It's enough in palliative care for people to have a serious life-limiting illness to deserve our service so that we can maybe help to improve the quality of their life. Be careful about this sentence. We teach it too early and it's often misunderstood. Many of you have heard it. People die as they have lived. Now, yes. Some people do die as they have lived, and it's their right to do so. As long as this sentence is used to describe what we have seen, in retrospect, I have no problem with it. If people can get away with not changing and dying as they have lived, so be it. But many people change in remarkable ways during the last months, weeks, sometimes days and hours of life in ways that are important to them and to their families. And you know what? It's their right to do that too. I rail against this statement because so often we teach it early and, and medical students and even uh, hospice and palliative care volunteers um, think it's predictive, not descriptive, but predictive of what's going to happen. Therein lies the basis of therapeutic nihilism. Because if people are going to die as they have lived, why bother? Why show up at all? Give them their pain medicine and let them be, right? But in fact, some people change in remarkable ways. This is Charlie Counts, his real name. I use it with permission. Charlie was um, one of these SOB patients. Short of breath, I mean. What did you think? Charlie had emphysema, he developed a non-small cell lung carcinoma, and we cared for him for over 14 months in hospice care. Charlie was, by his own description, not a very nice guy, Dr. Bayak. 
He had been a building contractor in the state of Alaska and, and the state of Montana, where I was practicing. He came to the end of life, to his illness, with serious fractured relationship in his past. He had things he wasn't proud of, things he wanted to make amends for. He spent a lot of time writing letters and making phone calls and getting back in contact with previous close friends, with his family, making amends. He strengthened relationships. He mended relationships. He made new relationships. As he came to the end of life, it was important for Charlie to pour and carve his own headstone. Here he is shown finishing it. He told me one day with a twinkle in his eye, he said, Dr. Bayak, it's really important that I do this because you know what? I want to make damn sure what's printed on it. As he was leaving this life, a month before he died, we had a cup of coffee together and Charlie said, I've grown a lot this last year. Bingo, he put his finger on it. He had grown as a person. He was not the same guy that he was before his illness. He was a really nice guy when I knew him. Charlie was a sensitive, soft, giving, um, um, generous man. He changed in ways that were important to him and important to his family. He did not die as he had lived. He grew through his illness. In fact, I think we need to expand the problem-based model of medicine to acknowledge that we also nurture and protect people's ability to grow and develop individually and together. Now, there is a mainstream branch of medicine that has this conceptual model. You may have heard of it. It's called pediatrics. Pediatrics does not confine to simply addressing problems. It acknowledges that people grow and develop through life. I think palliative care does exactly the same thing and that the conceptual model of palliative care or the best care for people with life-limiting illness needs to look conceptually much more like pediatrics than internal medicine. Okay, I want to play one little um, audio clip for you. This is from a national public radio show. time now for show. Story Corp. Today, a story about reaching the end of life. It was recorded as part of StoryCorps' new legacy initiative, an effort to collect interviews with people who have life-threatening conditions. In 2010, David Plant was diagnosed with skin cancer, which has since metastasized in other parts of his body. David recently sat down with his stepson to talk about his death. I'm David Plant. I'm almost 81 years old, and I'm about to speak to my son, Frank. My name's Frank Lilly. Difference in names is because David is my stepfather, but I certainly consider him my father. So you first met me when I was about nine or 10 years old when you married my mother. And I'm just wondering what your impressions were of me at the time. You were a good looking athletic guy, but you were in the unhappy situation of broken family. I didn't have a lot of people to look up to at that time or a lot of friends really. And so you became one of those very rapidly and that meant a lot to me. You know, I was thinking the other day of how much I've looked up to you and used you as an example. And I realized that's what I'm doing right now again. I'm watching all of this and I'm trying to learn. How are you handling all this? Well, I think in a year from now I won't be here. I'm not anxious about whether there's a heaven or whether there's music or clouds or whatever. I'm more anxious about the end of life journey. I want it to be quiet, contemplative, and calm. For me, dying, it's very enlightening and certainly rewarding. Look at the opportunity to talk, for example. It's just incredible. We would coast around having a drink before dinner, never get down to anything that was serious. That's exactly right. But I don't regard this as the terminal point of these conversations because I'm confident we're going to talk again and again. What would you like to see after you go? I mean, what is your legacy? I would just like people to believe that humility, listening to the other person and trying to understand the other person, and forgiving are important. You know, to be honest, I don't feel like I have to forgive you for anything. I'm really just very grateful, and I love you, and I thank you. Thank you. So 
that's different than the sorts of end-of-life experiences you often think about. David was a busy, um, uh, successful attorney. But when he came to me, he came with discomfort and pain, but he also wanted to know, how can I die well? Not well in the right way to do it, but he wanted to be well within himself. It is part of the human condition that despite the ravages of disease, we are more than our bodies. We have the human capacity to be well within ourselves, even as we are leaving this life. That is, I promise you, something that I've been taught again and again by patients, that if we don't just focus on their, their physicality, they have a capacity to die well if we're treating pain if we're helping manage the bowels, if we're doing the things that, that allow them to be generally comfortable, to know that they're not too heavy a burden on their families. How can we best serve people who are, we cannot cure? I've come to, to think about the analogy of accompanying people on a journey, a journey neither would choose. Now, my wife, is, Yvonne, are you still here? There's, my wife, Yvonne, is here. Now, Yvonne and I love to spend time on rivers. We're both fly fishermen. We're not great boatsmen, however, and we know that rivers can be dangerous. Even rivers that you know can change from one season to another. There's side channels, there's things that fall in the river. You have to be really adept at using a boat if you're gonna be safe on this river. If I'm running a river, that I, even if one that I've known before, I wanna have a guy like this, right? Somebody who's rugged and has been there before, who has the technical skills of being able to navigate that, that river raft or river boat in, in, without hardly thinking about it. But also somebody who knows enough to know, to ask us what we want out of the day. Where do we want to go? What do we want to do with our day? You know, we're going to be on the river and whatever happens with the weather or with anything else, he wants to be safe and make sure we're reasonably comfortable, but also meet our goals. Now, you know, I'm not this guy on a river. I want to have one of these guys with me. But when somebody has a serious illness and they're facing an illness journey that they would not choose, I am that guy. I've been on this journey with many, many people. I have the technical skills, as many of you will, to make sure that they're safe and reasonably comfortable. Sharon was a patient who I became close to. I write about her in the book you've been given, The Best Care Possible. Sharon is not her real name, but this, was, this is her. She had cystic fibrosis. She had a bad form of cystic fibrosis, many copies of the, of the uh, culpable gene. Um, and, when, and we became not just patient and, and physician, but we became friends. We didn't cross professional boundaries, but she got under my skin. I cared for her as a friend. I was emotionally involved. People say, well, you can't be emotionally involved with all these patients because it will just drain you emotionally. Yeah, that's sometimes true, but we are not glasses that are, that are filled up with emotion that it only leaks out. Sometimes we can be filled up, refilled, by the enrichment of the work, the, the privileged work of being physicians. Sharon enriched my life and still does. When I approach people, I use this phrase, the best care possible when I meet a new patient. I say often to people, I want to make sure you receive the best care possible. Because for one thing, it's the only thing I know everybody, despite our highly diverse societies, really wants. When you or someone you love is seriously ill, you want the best care possible. I don't know what that is for you or you or you, but I know through shared decision making that I can delineate in a highly personalized fashion what the best care is for each person at each point in time. We do it iteratively. So I say, I want to make sure you receive the best care possible. In addition to the treatments for this disease, that includes attending to your symptoms and your sense of well-being. In focusing on your physical health, I don't want to ignore how this illness affects your personal life, your feelings, your hopes, your fears, as well as those of your family. It's an easy way, and I offer you to use it. I haven't branded the term. Try using this phrase, the best care possible, as an empty vessel into which you're going to pour specific personalized meaning and develop a personalized plan of care. 
I also often say this to patients when I first meet them. Even though we are, we are maybe unable to realistically hope for a cure, there will always be things that we can do to improve your comfort and your quality of life. And we'll walk those difficult steps with you too. I've taught myself to say this out loud. Most physicians assume that their patients know we're not going to abandon them. But it's often helpful to say it out loud. Because in not talking about following people through the end of life, sometimes people intuit or assume that the doctor's not talking about this because it's going to be horrible. So horrible that even he doesn't want to talk about it. So we say this, and people have occasionally come back to me, you know, months after and said, boy, it's been really, it was really important that you said that to me when we first met. How do you accompany people on this journey down this river of illness? We have to be competent in the knowledge base and skills of medicine, including symptom management, but also in communication. We have to be reliable, making sure that we're there or that one of our colleagues is there. We're not going to be there every single time, but just like uh, on any journey, we may pass off from one captain of a ship to another or from the, from the you know, shuttle driver to the bus driver to the pilot of a, a plane, uh, the professionalism of accompanying people on this journey. Our colleagues, we work in teams. We need to be honest. People have a right to information about their illness and treatment, and in words they can understand. Authenticity is important. In the shorthand, it means being real, being able to speak our minds, understanding our professional boundaries. You remember the three? No personal gain, no sex, no killing. If you ever forget them, email me. But beyond that, we can bring our whole self to the clinical encounter. That's why I teach professional boundaries in those simplified ways. Because if you can remember, you know, no personal gain, no sex, no killing, then you can relax and have emotions. You, it's okay to feel sad. It's okay to laugh with people. I tend to, to tease and kibitz people and joke with people. It's okay. It's okay to touch somebody and comfort them if it's in their service, not in your own. If you feel like they would be comforted by putting your hand on their shoulder or giving them a hug, that doesn't cross professional boundaries. It's totally normal. It's authentic. It's being human. If you can't bring your whole self to the clinical encounter, then your profession is going to seem really long and very parched and dry. You can bring your whole self to the clinical encounter and enjoy the interactions with patients. You know, that brings joy to your day. Non-attachment means that even though you may wish to be able to cure or serve everyone, let's be honest, you know, no one gets out of this one alive and we're going to be disappointed at times. We're going to, you know, know that we're going to lose people that we come to befriend and be close with. And that's part of the job. That's part of what we give in, in joining this profession, that we're going to absorb that sadness. We're going to have to breathe through it and keep our hearts open in service. And, and then imagination. Our ability to imagine how we may serve people whose, whose disease we cannot cure. Um, imagination really is our key therapeutic tool. Now that may seem like new age or pop psychology. I don't mean it like that at all. But in fact, imagination is part of the ground substance of therapeutics. With caring intention, with the knowledge base and skill of our discipline, we can then begin to imagine how we may serve a person. In fact, and this is my most cherished um, professional clinical tool that I'm about to share. My ability to be a good counselor, to really be a good doctor to people who I cannot cure, entails being able to imagine the person well. Whew. I don't mean that I'm, I can imagine how I can cure a disease that the oncologist or the cardiologist or the neurologist can't cure, but I mean imagining a person well within themselves. And that involves two types of imagination. The first was, was talked about earlier in narrative histories. You know, to be able to elicit a story of a patient's illness or the story of their life 
and begin to imagine what they must be going through. We can never say to people, I know what you're going through. That's a heartless statement. You do not. You can never know what somebody else is going through. But you can say, I can only imagine how hard this must be for you. Or it's painful for me to imagine what you must be going through. If that's done with authenticity, if you have paused and taken the time and invested the emotional energy to actually imagine what they're going through, if you can hear the patient's story as if you were the speaker, if you can begin to look at the patient's uh, future as if looking through his or her eyes, that takes some risk to our own emotions, but in so doing, you can come into what I've called receptive alignment with the patient, so that you actually have a sense of seeing this journey as if you're standing shoulder to shoulder with the patient. When you can do that and you're, and you have, you're in this receptive, imaginative alignment, then sometimes I can begin to look into the future and begin to imagine an achievable goal within the person's values, preferences, and priorities that we can work together to achieve. It begins to use my generative imagination to begin to, to, to serve the people, person in ways that are important to them personally. Sharon was such a person, just to give you an example of what this looks like. Now, Sharon uh, loved this, this fellow, Jeff Corwin. Does Jeff Corwin, he's on the Animal Planet channel. Does anybody know him here? So Jeff, is, Jeff Corwin is, is somebody who's on TV a lot, um, and he's a, he's a, a biologist uh, and, 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 and does things with uh, exotic animals. Okay. Sharon, although she knew she wasn't going to live into adulthood, in her fantasy, she wanted to be a veterinarian or an animal care worker. Whenever she was in the hospital, and she was in the hospital a lot with exacerbations of cystic fibrosis, you couldn't come into her room when Jeff Corwin's Animal Planet channel was on the TV. Or if you did come into the room, you had to sit down and watch it quietly with her, and you could talk to her after it ended. So I watched the Animal Planet a fair amount with, with Sharon. After I came to know her and, and we established somewhat of a friendship, one day I said, you know, Sharon, why don't you write him a letter? You obviously love this guy. Why don't you write him a letter and, 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 and communicate with him? And she said, oh, I, you never, you know, he would never read a letter that I wrote. I said, no, why don't you try? He, she said, I couldn't even get it to him. How could I get him a letter? He means on TV. And I said to her, you write a letter to him. I'll get it to him, I promise. I had no idea how I would do that. But I've done harder things than that in my life. And so for two weeks, I worked with her a bit while she scratched out a letter. And we edited it a little bit. And her mother worked with her to edit a letter. And she wrote about a three-page handwritten letter. And I got it to him. Well, this guy is a hell of a nice guy. I've never met him. But within 48 hours, he actually responded to her letter. And he invited her down. It just so happens that his, he has a farm with, uh, with animals that's about 100 miles from where we live. I didn't know that either, but it turns out to be the case. And he invited her down. And she came down and spent a day with him. When she came back from that visit, Sharon told me it was the best day of her life. Now, folks, I tell you this story because none of this fits within the problem-based model of medicine. We imagined together what she might do to achieve that was of value to her. This is Sharon within six weeks of her death. She came back to the pediatric ward because she wasn't going to come back anymore. She was going to be home through the end of her life. The pediatric floor had celebrated this remarkable young woman for the person she was. Here's another bit of imagination. This is, um, I'll call her Joanne. Joanne had a terrible pelvic tumor that every time they operated, they kept getting positive margins. She had had something called a pelvic exenteration. All of her organs were gone. And yet, every time, they still had positive margins. So she had back dressings and, you know, and, and uh, drain tubes. And she was requiring a lot of intravenous fluids every day to keep her uh, pressures up. And this morning, my two colleagues, Dr. Bakaitis and Dr. Brokaw, were here. We, this morning, we had to tell Sharon that despite our best efforts, we couldn't get her back home. 
that she lived in a rural area with just her husband, and, and despite, and we're pretty clever at getting people home, she was requiring too much intravenous fluid every day and too many mechanical bells and whistles to get her home. And so we had to tell her that, is, that despite all of our efforts, we couldn't. And it was a really hard day, and she cried a lot. It, we were at her bedside during morning rounds for over 45 minutes. Before we left her bedside that morning, as we ask almost every patient every day, we said, Joanne, is there anything we can do to just brighten your day today? She looked him up and said, I'd love a daiquiri. <laughs> well, we can do that. <laughs> we can't do a lot of stuff, but we could. So we ran across the street to the liquor store, and we got her uh, uh, some rum and a daiquiri. Now, my colleagues promised me that their daiquiris were virginal, but Joanne's wasn't. We were caring for her as a whole person, not just as a set of you know, organ functions or, or physiologic deficits. This is her two weeks later at a hospice house where we were able to get a, a place to care for her outside the hospital. And the team went down and just celebrated this person for the remarkable person she was. And lastly, there's Harry. Harry, similarly to, jo to Joanne, had a terrible set of uh, tumors. He had a, uh, one of these very aggressive transitional cell carcinomas and had had multiple surgeries, kept getting positive margins. We told him we were unable to get him home. When I asked Harry, Harry, is there anything seriously important left undone in your life? He said, yeah, I got to marry Betty. He, had been, he and Betty had been um, lovers uh, uh, you know, uh, for 14 years, but they had never been able to combine their households. They had never married because of work and, and financial issues. So we got it together. We arranged for the chaplaincy department to have a, a wedding in Harry's room in the, on the surgical floor. This is the sort of stuff that hospice does all the time, right? Um, here is the witnesses to Harry and, and Betty's wedding. These are medical students and, and nurses. Now, what's remarkable for me is that while we do this in hospice with some frequency, these medical students weren't on their hospice or their palliative care rotation. They were on their surgery rotation. They were learning that sometimes the best surgical care possible includes being witnesses at a patient's wedding, celebrating the joy of, of union of these two people who love one another. So that's what I came across the ocean to say. This, by the way, is my father, Seymour Bayak, and my now 32-year-old daughter, Leela. Dad was living with and dying of pancreatic cancer at, the, at this time. The nature of serious illness is personal. It's only partly medical. So in the midst of the most difficult of patients' experiences, we can serve them well by understanding that illness is personal. We can bring, yes, pain management, but so much more than that. We can bring our creative imagination to serve people as whole persons so that they are able to, to live fully, to grow individually and together through the very end of life. I think that that is our great privilege and great challenge as clinicians in this modern world and our great promise to our society and the culture we serve. It's a great privilege to be in front of you. Thank you for the work that you do, and thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts with you tonight.